internationally successful mental medium. Sally Morgan, a flamboyant television medium is getting full houses throughout the UK. She's packing out 1,000 seat theatres. Sally Morgan has an alluring positive personality and is converting many to accepting the afterlife. She is a good medium, when she gives a reading she mentions names and places, and identifies relationships correctly. Sally has been on the end of a campaign in the UK, the media they're fraudulently accusing her, of obtaining information from an unknown, helper. That claim is now being withdrawn. The, critics, then tried to claim she is, cold reading, absolute rubbish, there is also an upstart magician, who is trying to attack her, to get some publicity for himself confessing he himself was a fraud and a cheat. This is what psychologists call projecting his own fraud onto Sally. Sadly, the more successful and brilliant one is, the more enemies one makes. Medium Sally Morgan film clip here shows how she injects a welcome humor into afterlife communications, hopefully dispelling the skeptics of their desperate disabling infantile fears of you. And notably, humor, lightheartedness, is one thing missing from skeptic utterances. Humor can lift one out of depression and prevent one becoming too serious, a criticism leveled at most skeptics, so have a good laugh at these afterlife communications. They are most engaging and they can't hurt you, guys. Have no fear. Showtime approaching, Sally needs to mentally prepare. Even though I'm two and a half hours from going on stage, I'm really working, I'm in work mode. So, um, because I'm in the theatre. Very difficult to explain to people because I know people think that she must have these thoughts in her head 24-7. I don't have them in my head. I I'm not aware of my mind going into the Sally Morgan medium mode, you could say. But it does. And that's exactly what keeps the crowds coming. We've been itchy for tickets for ages, so with this date came up, but it was straight away get one as soon as possible. And we got two rows from the front, <laughs> so we're hoping to give her a wave and she might pull us out. Fingers crossed. Here she comes. Hey, dear. Sally's obviously got the powers that um, I think a lot of people would like to have. Um, and I think she, when you know, she gives her messages, it just brings happiness to lots of people that have lost loved ones. I'm yeah. sort of skeptical unless I get a message. I don't think it'll turn me really. Nah, I still believe. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love you all, keyboards. We love you. Um, as well as Sally's impromptu on-stage readings, the audience can also ask Sally about their loved ones by writing questions on cards before the show. We'll do a card. Let's do that. Let's have a look at this, what we've got here. Oh, Mandy, where are you, love? Behave yourself. What do you think? I'm auto trader. Where are you? <laughs> Stand up, Mandy. Shall I buy the car? Well, she picked out a card from the box, and on it I'd written, shall I buy the car? And it was hopefully a message for our dad. Hello. Hello. Shall I buy the car? Absolutely. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> Completely and utterly. You should, uh, you should buy the car. What has just happened as I'm looking at you, there is a man just walked on here. And this is I walked on. What car's that then? <laughs> Where'd you get that money from then? <laughs> it's his money! <laughs> You're a man, <laughs> What, on a car then? You can spend the money on a car then? Well, yeah, I bought it yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> and I just wanted to make, you know, for him to say, yes, it was okay. Yeah. <laughs> if I'd have said no, would you 
you don't worry, I'll take it back then. You would not have said that, Mandy. <laughs> would you? You wouldn't have done that. He's standing here like that. He's smiling, really. He would have said that. Oh, what's this about a new car? But he'd be saying, when my mum wasn't there, he'd be saying, go on, you go and get the car. Wouldn't he? He would have a bit of a joke about it. I think he maybe have liked to have seen the money a bit longer <laughs> in the bank of <laughs> Oh, a lovely car, Mandy. Um, now, what, I'm just watching a wardrobe door open. This is what he's showing me. I get taken into little scenes, you see, and I'm watching a wardrobe door open. Why, what's that? Well, the money weren't in the wardrobe, was it? Uh, what's that mean, then? It's in the wardrobe. <laughs> I think he's got more of the ump that is in the wardrobe than he's in the car. He's got me. He's got to have seen a hand over the wardrobe door like that. He's um... gone. Oh. We, ha we haven't scattered his ashes yet. <laughs> well, I'm not saying you should scatter his ashes, but I think he should be somewhere else. I mean, you shut that wardrobe door, man, Jim. Where's he gone? He's in the bleeding dark. <laughs> He's been in the greenhouse. Oh. <laughs> you see, I, I think, I have to tell you, Mandy, I, I actually think he preferred the greenhouse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What on earth possessed you to put him in the wardrobe? It was too cold. Yeah, it was too cold. <laughs> but he was a very keen gardener. And that's why he was put in the greenhouse. And then of course it got cold, so my mum brought him in and put him in the wardrobe. <laughs> Who is Ken? <laughs> I know a Ken, but nothing to do with my dad. No, but is Ken to do with you then? Mm. <laughs> 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 <coughs> oh, Mandy. Wolves have ears. <laughs> Let's thank lovely Mandy. I came tonight, I was very sceptical. I came with my sister and my daughter and I'm a sceptic and I got the message. <laughs> so I've got this, 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 this man here and this is what he says, her name is Sharon. You thought someone was in the other room laughing. It was me, Sharon. It's Pete. Oh! Oh! You heard me! He's going, you heard me! You heard me! And then you said, no, it couldn't have been him, it was me! Sharon! <laughs> oh, he's hurt me so, Sharon. What's the matter with him, love? He's here, darling. It's been three years, but that three years has just been terrible. What was I put there for, Sharon? What was I put there for? Where, where's he buried, darling? Where, he don't, he's not happy about where he's been put, really. What's he talking about? Was there a row? No. He's, he's, still, in me, he's still in my wardrobe. <laughs> no, another one. No! Get out of it! <laughs> yeah, you, you're not telling me. They orchestrate the evening. Shad. <laughs> yeah, you used to say that, yeah. I just cry every day for my pain. I love him. He was my work, my soulmate. There's a lady who just walked in. <laughs> Can't breathe properly. <laughs> That's my mum. <laughs> Sharon. <laughs> oh, Sharon, all her, all her top part of her is all hunched. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How did you expect me to stay here, Sharon, when I felt as rough as that? I wasn't well. Let's thank this lady. I can't explain how it feels well. to, to know that Pete was there with me. You just hope that a loved one's going to come through and then when I got Pete and also my mum, it's just amazing.
Uh, just here for a minute, skeptics. I'm uh, uh, just wondering whether you're not able to understand the concept of mediumship because it is seemingly so baffling. How can some people pick up communications from the dead? It just seems totally ridiculous. Well, if they can, just assume that they're not dead. It's kind of obvious, isn't it? The most obvious conclusion is that discarnate spirits are clearly not dead. They're still functioning intelligence-wise. But still you've got the problem. How come some people seem to be chosen? It just doesn't make sense. How could it happen? Well, there's a simple metaphorical explanation I'll give you now, and it's very, very simple. It enables you to get a handle on how it works to become a medium. Um, so that you can function, you have a effectively a barrier around you, it's some kind of physical brain barrier. It stops other people's thoughts landing in your head. Realize that you could not function, you couldn't survive uh, if you kept picking up everybody else's thoughts around you. Mother, father, brother, sisters, neighbors, passing motorists, other kids in the class. Your internal mind would be utter chaos. So you've got some kind of physical thought barrier which makes you think inside your head that you are alone okay now how do we know it physically exists because some people get brain damage and the barrier is pierced slightly it starts to leak and they start to pick up uh, intelligent voices and signals from deceased people who are clearly still intelligently active now it happened to a friend of mine in south carolina called gina she had adult measles in her mid 20s, the raging temperature nearly died, and a few days later she started to hear voices every time she walked past the cemetery. Um, some of them are very angry voices and um, very nasty people, but some of them were very smart and loving people, and they would give her messages. She worked in a shop, and uh, she'd be told, keep asking the customers, there's a message for the customer who was cooking bacon at 10 past 8 this morning, there's a message for them. And that would come from a female deceased person in the head of Gina. Only because the brain barrier in her has been slightly pierced by brain injury. And deceased people, that's uh, discarnate spirits, then see her, they can see through her eyes and see what she sees, you see. So she becomes a window to deceased spirits. Now, that actually happened to a good friend of mine in South Carolina. And most mediums have near-death experiences where they get some kind of brain damage. Sally Morgan will be a good example. She probably had some brain damage in her childhood. Some people are just born that way. they got some defect in their brain thought barrier. But I hope this gives you some path to, uh, toward a simple understanding. The brain barrier, the thought barrier, is simply pierced by some kind of brain damage. Okay? It should make a lot more sense to you now. So there's no need to be... a to be scared of mediumship at all. So now that you've got a working metaphor to explain how some people become mediums, basically brain damage due to trauma and stress, um, you can find this, for example, on the program Sensing Murder, uh, where they get all, each of the mediums are able to contact the dead and, and solve murder cases. Um, they all had extremely traumatic childhoods, extremely cruel, violent childhoods, okay? So that gives you a clue. They've got the brain damage uh, early in life and they don't ask for these abilities to be thrust upon them. It just seems to be like an accident, okay? so But now you can get on Google, look it up, see who else, what are, how many other mediums have had brain damage too. It suddenly makes things fall into place for you. I hope it gives you um, a lily pad to stand on for a while, our skeptics. That's all we need as metaphorical thinkers to run with. Okay, we're happy to do that.